This morning is from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 34. And if you are using one of the red Bibles in the back, um, Luke 12, 13 through 34 can be found on page 57 of the New Testament. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Then he said to the crowd, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And Jesus told them a parable, saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And the rich man began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to the rich man, You fool! This very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And Jesus said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, Do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you? You men of little faith. And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink. And do not keep worrying, for all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. But your Father knows what you need, knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts, which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Kids, with your parents' permission, you may be dismissed to junior worship. And a special thank you. Uh, we have gotten enough volunteers to make it through Memorial Day, so thank you for people stepping up. And another thank you before we get to our sermon today that we want to acknowledge Pastor John is not here this week. May 10th is a Friday night that we will be celebrating his 25th year here at Grace Community Church. And so it is worthy of the celebration. And if you are interested, we will have sign-up sheets all the Sundays in April. But there is a limited seating arrangement because it will be held in here. There will be up to 200. So the expiration date on you being able to be part of the celebration is if your number is 1 through 199 or 200, or you get your uh, name in before April 28th. You can sign up on Facebook now. For those in my generation and older, you can email or even call me, 
and we can get your name registered. Again, May 10th, if you can keep that date on your calendar. Let's petition the Lord one more time before we look into his word. The man of all sorrows, he never forgot what sorrow was carried by the hearts that he bought. Lord, many of us come wounded this morning, some from self-inflicted wounds, others from the wounds of a world desperately wanting the wound. Lord, those self-inflicted wounds come because we desire more than to be merely in the world. We sometimes want to be a part of it. This world's passing show does entice, and those enticements lead to entanglements. May the glories of Jesus so enthrall us today. May your word so stir us this day that the heart that aches because of our waywardness and folly would become a heart that again longs for its heavenly home, the home that you gladly give to those who are yours. In Christ Jesus, I pray, amen. What will sustain you and me for this long-term pilgrimage? What will have us on that day when we have sang in the past, not today, but by the way, Tyler, great job leading the worship and all the worship team. Thank you again. What will sustain us on that day when our strength is failing, our end draws near, our time has come? What will keep us singing like the Apostle Paul I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. How do we faithfully keep the faith? How do we endure in this walk in the wilderness between figurative Egypt, our former slavery, what we were chained to, our sin, before Christ laid a hold of us and freed us, So how do we faithfully endure this wilderness journey replete with toils and snares and defeats yet like the Apostle Paul be full of faith? You know, the promised land here now being the eternal realm where King Jesus reigns and where his subjects gladly subject themselves to his reign. Well, let me submit to you what it is not. What is not a long-term strategy for sustaining the faithfulness that Paul had, that Paul described to his loving son in the faith, Timothy. And bear with me, it will sound maybe perhaps a little heretical, but I hopefully you'll be able to hang on with me to see where we're going. How not to sustain yourself? It's not to single-handedly and in your own strength demanding more of yourselves in the way of study. I got to stick to the yearly Bible reading plan. So help me God. No, it's not solely better discipline. It's not you and I single-handedly in our own strength laboring more avidly until we're too exhausted to go to bed. So it's not a more intense physiology. It is not you and I, in our own strength, committing more of our treasure to that box back there. Before I say what it is, let me say this. Certainly demanding more of ourselves is a good thing. It is a must. Or actually, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Demanding more is good. Paul tells Timothy in the first letter to Timothy, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So there is good in constant, continual, sustaining Bible study. 
It is a must if we are to grow, but growth is much more robust when the have to becomes a get to. The delight is there. Bible study is a great thing. Are we delighting in what it's doing for us instead of checking off a box? Certainly laboring long in the fields of the harvest is a good and godly thing. Jesus from John 4, though he was weary, he was thirsty, he was just by a well on his journey through Samaria. Instead of Jesus having his real physical needs met, he chose to engage with a lonely Samaritan woman who was there in the heat of the day. A woman who was familiar with engagements and the heat of relationships gone bad. Five separate marriages and the man she was currently engaged with, well, she dropped the pretense. She wasn't even going through the motions. She wasn't even married and yet Jesus chose to engage her. See, our problem is, is we think we have to labor and go to Albania when the cashier at Aldi just needs a smile. And perhaps, how are you? With an intense look in our eyes, like we really mean it. Sacrificial giving is plainly encouraged. It's encouraged in our passage today, verse 33, sell your possessions, give to charity. Paul said, God loves a joyful giver. The problem with those things isn't the things themselves, but it's assignment Christianity. It's the doing of the dues. The work becomes the fixation and not the fixing of our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith, Jesus himself, and delighting in him. That, I submit to you, the delight in Jesus more than anything else will sustain us for the long haul and then allow us to gladly go out into the world. It will gladly allow us to get into our checkbooks. For you younger people on your app, sooner or later, you'll be able to give that way. It will allow us, with our little cup of coffee and our whole lot of Jesus early in the morning, delight to open his word. We must, but brothers and sisters, we must be about continually delighting in the supremely delightable. The God who without fail, the God who without let up is for his people. Psalm 56 you have kept my, count of my tossings. You have put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? This I know. God is for me. That great truth alone. God is for you. God is relentless in his pursuit of joy. God is relentless in the pursuit of his people. Know this, God is relentless in seeing joy come to his people. It was about a month ago I had that aha moment in my own personal Bible study. Luke 12, 32, and how happy I became how happy I want you to be if you are in Christ. How happy to read verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. To read merely the beginning. Do not be afraid. This is Jesus himself assuring his very Jewish disciples of this great fact. In the presence of your heavenly Father, 
you have no need to have any fear. Juxtapose that thought, that New Testament thought, that otherworldly thought with what happened at Mount Sinai 1,500 years earlier. Jesus' ancestors, his disciples' ancestors, God's chosen ones were powerfully brought out of Egypt and had only begun their 40-year journey through the wilderness. 40 years. Exodus 20 recounts the story of the law of God being given to the people through his mediator, Moses. Exodus 20, 18 and 19. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Do you hear the fear? The people trembled. In the Hebrew language, which the Old Testament was written, trembled to toss about, to shake, to cause, to totter. In that state, these people do something really rational. They stand at a distance. They don't want to come near. They don't want to approach the unapproachable purity and holiness and power of Almighty God. They saw that power displayed earlier. It was in their rearview mirror. The strongest army known to mankind at that point. The Egyptians with their chariots, with their horses, with their weapons of war now all at the bottom of the Red Sea, never again to bring the Israel, or never again to bring Israel, a moment of anxiety. The people said to Moses, do not let God speak to us or we will die. It is a scene that is played out again and again since the garden. Adam and Eve introducing sin into the world being stained by it, they hid, the Israelites hid, not wishing for God to address them. Because of his absolute judicial right to dress them down. Moses' followers, they understood their guilt. But as we wing it back to the New Testament in Luke 12, Jesus, God of very God, who would through his perfect life become the fulfillment of the law handed down to Moses. Jesus bringing this radically new covenant could rightly speak to the people in Luke 12. This is the Jesus who desires not only for his disciples not to fear. The great shepherd speaks to those he knows need his constant care and attention. Do not be afraid, little flock. The tender heart of Jesus comes shining forth in Matthew 9, 36. Seeing the people... He felt compassion for them because they were distressed. They were dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. What Christ saw in Matthew was not unlike his distressed and dispirited forebears who were cowering in fear at Mount Sinai. Moses up in the mountains receiving the law but unlike Moses, Moses could not ultimately mediate, could not serve due to his own sin. He could not bring his fellow wilderness wanderers into the promised land. Jesus, the fulfillment of that law, more than its equal, more than up to its requirements, Jesus was the one who Moses himself 
was looking forward to. Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord your God, this is Moses speaking, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. You shall listen to him. And it is our great joy, 20 centuries later, wait a minute, two millennia later, to still listen to his word, his unchanging, peace-giving word. Well, before we get to the completion and the crescendo of verse 32, the God who gladly gives, let us desire to follow Moses' admonition. Let us listen to the great fulfillment of the law as he struck, instructs us to look at eternal things here in Luke 12. In his teaching leading up to verse 32, Jesus is going to address three things. Greed. He's going to address selfishness and possessions. And he's also going to address worry. So three different topics. Now, make no distinction between the three terms of what's really bad and what's kind of bad. Because sometimes we can worry about the right things, can't we? Now, worry is putting a billboard on I-75 in a very high traffic area saying, I don't trust you, God. But before we get to worry... And I say that again, as a recovering worrier, you don't believe me, you can ask my wife. Let's look at verses 13 through 15. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, Beware, be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. So point number one in your sermon notes, if you are taking notes, greed easily lurks in the heart of man. What is greed? Greed is the gnawing, constant desire for more. And when you get it, it just isn't quite enough. Greed, in modern day vernacular, always moves the goalposts. Now, let's put the context to the crowd mentioned here in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus. For that, we have to go back to the very beginning of the chapter, verse 1. So many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another. Jesus began saying to his disciples. Now, the NAS, which we read from today, could leave us with the impression that those listening to Jesus were mildly klutzy. They were stepping on one another as awkward dancers. But the Greek word here is often understood to mean trample, to tread on. Now you might say, well, that's great information, but what does that have to do with greed? Well, think about it. Think through this with me. How did this particular person get within earshot of Christ? If the crowd was under no compulsion to care for one another, in fact, they would trample on one another, they would flatten one another in order to get to Jesus. You have to be pretty focused on your thing so that the greed that had laid hold of this man caused him to put himself in harm's way. He was willing to risk potential injury or perhaps perhaps blinded by his own greed he was willing to harm others in order to get close enough to have his grievance heard 
further, verse 1 ends, Jesus began instructing his disciples. Now, what he instructed in the next 12 verses, we just didn't have time. But here's the context. I think it best shows up in verses 4 and 5. This is what Jesus said because he's talking about eternal, weighty matters throughout those 12 verses. Verses 4 and 5. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that, there's no more they can do. I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one, after he is killed, has the authority to cast you into hell. Yes, fear him. Jesus is speaking on the biggest issue of his day. He's speaking on the biggest issue of Adam and Eve's day. On our day, the eternal issue of heaven and hell has historically been the big issue. Jesus says here, there is a healthy fear. Now, he could have easily gone back to his and the disciples' own forebears on Mount Sinai that we mentioned earlier. But 1,500 years later, God has come in the flesh. John, John 1, the Word became flesh and He dwelt among us. He tabernacled with us. He had become approachable even in a crowd this size. And here is this man, instead of listening to Jesus' very valuable teaching, he waited for Jesus to pause so that he could air his personal grievance. Now he did so under the pretext of fairness. He tried to conceal his, his greed. Verse 13 again, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Now, doesn't that just seem really fair? Well, half, divide it up. Well, first of all, we have to understand the culture. The oldest son got twice the portion of all the others. As the new patriarch, the oldest son had increased responsibility. In that familial first century culture in Palestine, as the father's closest representative, the oldest son was obligated to support any unmarried sisters, as well as his own family, perhaps his mother. Now, Jesus doesn't delve into that. He doesn't talk about what is right, what is proper. Jesus gets to the root of the problem, and he does so abruptly. Man is what verse 14 starts off with. Now, Jesus always displaying the fruit of the Spirit. So even in this stark response, which at first would seem unkind... And yet, it was a properly placed jolt akin to a parent watching a child head to a non-plugged wall so so socket with two fingers, inquisitive, outstretched. What's mom and dad going to do when they see it? Oh, isn't that cute? No, they're going to yell the child's name in order to get the child's attention, an abrupt voice is actually a gracious thing to do. Now verse 14 in the whole, man, who appointed me a judge over you? Now Jesus isn't abdicating his role that the Father had actually assigned to him. 2 Timothy 4.1, Christ Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. But Jesus on this earth had a laser-like focus. He would not get sidetracked. Jesus would not leave this man with what the man thought he wanted. 
How gracious of God to answer our prayers with a no. <laughs> yes? How often have, would we have been taken down a pathway that would have been wrong-headed had God not intervened? This man thought he wanted more which would mean he'd want more, which would be more. And he did so in the disguise of fairness. Jesus left this man and us something much more precious, a grace-filled warning. Verse 15, he said, Beware, be on your guard, against every form of greed. Now he said to them, so the audience expands from just the man to his disciples and all within earshot. So the first thing, the audience expands. Secondly, there's a vigilance. Beware. Be on your guard. Greed can so easily lurk in every one of our hearts. And notice the form. He says, beware against every form of greed. So we typically think greed is wrapped up in dollar signs. Money is where it begins, perhaps. But it's not always that we're greedy about money. It could be sex. Sex within marriage. The husband can be greedy for it, can he not? Could be respect. Could be ice cream. You laugh. How often have I gotten to that last bite? and ate it fast before somebody else got to it. Jesus warns us. By the way, money, sex, respect, ice cream, all very good gifts. But when the gift becomes, becomes the end game, it'll never be enough. What or where in your life does your heart bend toward greed? How do we deal with it? Stay tuned. Point number two. Verse 15 is actually a good transition verse. For e not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of possessions. If Christ actually did judge this man, judgment would look a lot like verses 16 through 21. Point number two, earthly possessions often possess the heart. Jesus recounts a parable beginning in verse 16. The land of a rich man was productive. The man began reasoning to himself, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns. I'll build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Come, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. This man had arrived. His ship had come in, and he was more than happy to just harbor it instead of sending it out in order to find ways to bless others. He had arrived without knowing where he was eternally going. Nowhere in the parable does Jesus say the man cheated anyone. Verse 16 just says, the land of a rich man was very productive. 
the land was productive. God, for his own sovereign purposes, chose to materially bless this man. Why? Well, Matthew 5, 45. God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The Almighty has his own purposes. So we bring it back to Luke 12. Note that the prosperous man never exhibits a hint of gratitude. Nothing outside of himself is worthy of the slightest consideration. He is into complete absorption. His possessions have now possessed his heart. The sheer number of personal pronouns is astounding. I counted six eyes and five mys. He sees himself as the owner of these newfound riches and not the steward of them. And that last personal pronoun completes a dreadful misunderstanding of ownership. I will say to my soul. Which brings about judgment. Verses 20 and 21. God said to him, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you. Who now will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. God speaks terrible words here. You fool. Don't, don't gloss over that. Out of Jesus' own mouth from Matthew 5, 22, whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So for you or me to use that designation, tread extremely lightly. Do so before uttering this. But for Jesus, who knew the hearts of men, John 2, 25, Jesus did not need to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. He saw in this suddenly prosperous man, he saw what the psalmist saw in Psalm 14.1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Jesus, the righteous, eternal judge, speaks of the man's soul, it being required of him. You see, this man did not own his own soul, even though he craved comforting it. And it's at this point you might be saying, now wait a minute, didn't we just sing, didn't, wasn't our last song, It Is Well With My Soul? You have to understand something. Anything that is eternal and not united to Christ is Christ. Because if it's eternal, it's going to live forever. If it does not have the wisdom of God, it can wreak all kinds of havoc. The ironic thing is, is when you or I become a life or a heart that's transformed, if we unite ourselves to Christ, if we go back to the innocence of the Garden of Eden, the edict was, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion over the earth. Only when we give of ourselves to Christ do we actually at that point in time possess our soul because we've given it to one who gifts it right back to us. Only believers can actually sing the song that Spafford wrote and sing it and mean it. It is well with my soul because we have our eyes on the end game. 
Now, maybe I spent too much time on that. Let me get back to the man who did not value his own soul, even though he tried to comfort it. See, he was going to tear down barns to build bigger barns that would eventually be torn down anyway. He was focused on the here and now and therefore forfeited what he believed to be his own soul. You and I in the Disneyland that is America. Even though your income might pale in comparison to someone else's, you are still rich. Richer than 70% of the world. How can you, how can I be rich towards the things of God? Well, stay tuned. We'll get to it. Point number three. Worry. Jesus is now going to address that. Worry robs us of the opportunity to trust God. You know, when you juxtapose worry from greed, greed never gets enough, whereas worry is the fear of never having enough. Juxtapose worry from relying on possessions. While possessions fool us into thinking of the here and now, worry is always on the later and robbing us of the moment that we are living in. Worry never expands the mind. It only shrivels it. On four separate occasions, between verses 22 and 29, Jesus admonishes us against the sin of worry. Because of time, we'll only look at two. Verses 22 through 24. Do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Verse 24, consider the ravens, for they neither reap nor sow. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? God created, and at every point in creation, God saw what he had done was good. Except one time, the very last portion. When he created humans, male and female, only then did he say, very good. Very can be an overused adverb, but in this instance and in relation to the rest of God's creation, we are talking about light years away from assigning value from humanity to everything else that God created. Jesus affirms that here in verse 24. God feeds the ravens. If we embedded souls, and in verse 23, that's what Jesus is saying, life is more than food in the body, and is more than clothing. We embodied souls are of infinite more value. And we should not be preoccupied with physical needs. If we are, if we're preoccupied with those, it is to be blind to what makes our existence unique. And secondly, it takes us down a pathway that makes us falsely believe that God doesn't care about our physical needs. Here's a shortcoming to worry. Verse 25, which one of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life's span? <laughs> the maker of time who simultaneously lives outside of time and has destined us, we who are in Christ, to live with him eternally. I, I love how John preached from Revelation 10 and 11. I love how he's preached from all of it. It's been so helpful. But he quoted Roland Allen, a missionary to China in the early 1900s. Allen said, I'm immortal until God's work for me is done. You and I, if you are in Christ, if I'm in Christ, we can live like this. Again, as a recovering warrior, that's me, and I can return to those awful starting blocks often. Which, by the way, you never get out of those starting blocks because you're too worried about what might happen if you actually run the race. 
Hopefully this is some encouragement. Because you know what? Worry, when it crops, when it rears its ugly head, it can be properly channeled and can become an opportunity for prayer, for trust. And this is the point where we turn back to verse 32. I began this morning by asking the question, what's going to sustain us for the long-term pilgrimage that is this walk through this world? It is not by training ourselves to fight greed. It is not to fight present comforts. It's, it's not to fight. It's to remind ourselves first and foremost before entering into that fight of the character and the commitment of our Creator God to His children. It is to remind ourselves again and again of verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock. Your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. This is for the church, those of you who worship the Father and God of our Lord Jesus. If you don't do that, but would like to understand, or if this has completely gone over your head, it's okay. For 24 years, the same thing happened to me. If you don't understand, if you're not in Christ, but would at least like some more information, find me in Pastor John's office after the service. Troy Ferryman and I will be there. If you want to talk alone, go to gracelima.com, email me later. I want to be available to the church. Your King, Jesus, fully and exactly representing the nature of of God the Father, didn't just say God has chosen to give you, though that would be spectacular. Your king inserted the wondrous adverb, gladly. The unchanging God is not presenting his kingdom as a part of guilt. The unchanging God is not presenting his kingdom because of pity. The unchanging God is presenting his kingdom to you because he is a giver of epic, a giver of prodigious portions. It is his great joy giving in extraordinary amounts is something that makes him happy. And if you and I are going to be his image bearers, greed will not be part of us. In fact, the possessions that we have to steward will flee from our hands and we'll gladly let them go. This isn't telling you now to sell everything you have and give to the poor, okay? Jesus did tell an individual within that. All I'm asking for you, brothers and sisters, and of myself, have open hands towards everything that the Lord has given you to steward. And don't worry about them because the possessions can sooner or later possess your heart. Meditate on the character and the goodness of God. And these things will not possess you, will not cause you to worry about losing them, or not cause you to, with greed, go after them. That's how we can be sustained. That's how we can become rich towards the things of God. Let's pray.